You have mentioned and pointed out some very key decisions that have been made under the influence of the order that have severely affected on a long-term basis our foreign policy. Oh, yes. Such as infamy at Pearl Harbor. Yes. Do you want to give a few uh, statements about each of these? There's about seven of them. Well, of course, Pearl Harbor was a disgrace because uh, the United States had broken the Japanese code. Roosevelt knew. Stimson was the member of the order. He was the one? Yeah, Stimson was the key man. What did he do? He, well, in, in conjunction with Roosevelt, they allowed the Japanese to go ahead and attack Pearl Harbor without any kind of uh, defense. They knew the Japanese were going to attack Pearl Harbor. They knew when, they knew where, they knew the planes were on the way because we'd broken the code. They allowed the attack to go forward to bring the United States into war. And Stimson is the key man. Stimson, you'll find on my membership list. Another one is the Manhattan Project, which was the super secret project to develop the atomic bomb. <laughs> there were two members uh, of the order were key in that thing, in getting that going and watching it over step by step. The whole development of the atom bomb. The target selection in Germany and Japan was under the control of uh, members of the order. A CIA uh, is uh, you find people all the time in intelligence. Uh, I mentioned Van Klein, but uh, William Sloan Coffin had been in the CIA before he became an anti-Vietnamese uh, level. So uh, throughout uh, throughout history, you can you can pick out these names. That's why I've got to do the analysis of for Harvard and Princeton because I think I'm the no one else will be able to recognize the implication of particular names. So we have a, a lot of missing names and missing yes. families, don't yes. we? I've only identified about 25% of the establishment. Well, who was the member of the order influencing the Korean War? That would be Stimson. Well, that was, no, Stimson, then you get Bundy, his... Uh, well, what was the, the fatal move they made? What did the order want to achieve in the Korean War? It seemed to me to be the first to know when wars, leading up to total surrender. That's the way I would read it now. Did the order have anything to do with recalling MacArthur? I've not looked at that. Uh, that would be interesting to look at because uh, the Forrestal family, I'm not sure who was instrumental in MacArthur's recall, but I seem vaguely to remember that, that I've not looked at that connection, but it's one that's well worth looking at. There seemed to be no logic to not pushing ahead and freeing the entire nation. No, it was a no-win war, just like Vietnam. It was absolute no-win war. And today we're reaping the results, but it's planned results, planned by the order. What do they have to do with pushing Romania into the communist orbit? Romania? Now, you've stumped me for the first time this, this evening. This, <laughs> is, this, this is, is out of my your, book. Yes, <laughs> you know, there's one problem with being an author, you forget what you write. I know, <laughs> you I, go have, on to I the have the next same one. problem. <laughs> um, but um, uh, that's a terrible admission to have to make. But it's I'll just take the next, next one. Uh, the NSC 68, the basis for oh, new yes. wars. NSC 68 by Kennan. Kennan is a, you see, Kennan is Princeton, he's not Yale. But he's in that this establishment elitist group. NSC 68 was a very interesting document, uh, National Security Council, um, in which basically the theme written, I think, in 1948 in around that period, there were several supplements to it. But the document was top secret for many years. And what it briefly argued is we shouldn't do anything to upset the Soviet Union. Uh, we should just be nice to them, be friends with them, give them what they want, and for heaven's sake, don't upset them. And that was the theme running through NSC 68. And that was the basis for U.S. policy, I guess, until, uh, well, perhaps even today. Because I notice we're not willing to stand firm on many issues. Well, it, looks, uh, it appears that we stand firm and then we back off, like um, Carter, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, Carter uh, cut off uh, the Ustek operation, but then we revived it five years later. So it's one step backwards, two steps forward. And the long-term goal is control. Control. Very paranoid are these people about being in control. That's, what, that's the whole outcome of this study. Yeah, now this is something I don't understand. Um, the, this desperate search for power. Um, 
And I'm not a very good person to understand this because if there's one thing I do not want in this world is power. Uh, I, I have enough trouble running my own life without running anybody else's life. Um, but these people have, seem to have this desperate need. It's almost a, a, a psychotic uh, hunger to control other people, manipulate other people. Um, and this I don't understand, but it, it is, it's more than money, it's more than greed. It's, it's the psychotic search for power That's right. behind it. And it seemed to me because they have no inner power, no inner resource, and so they get their power by controlling people, and the people really have the power, and they know who has the power, and if they don't control them, they'll cease to be in operation. They just won't be who they are anymore. So they are empty people inside. They're totally empty. They have nothing inside, and that's why they're desperate. And, and, and we don't have that need. We don't mm. ha sense the need for power because we feel the power of God, and it's sufficient to us. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I told you I was a little slow. <laughs> Well, how about the order in the attack on SDI? Oh dear, I am slow this evening. I, I have not yet identified a, 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 a direct link. Now, Vice President Bush is a member of the order. And uh, Vice President Bush, of course, is one of the few Republicans who's been ambivalent on SDI. If normally, you, you look at Dole, uh, your top-ranked Republican, Republicans have come out for SDI. Um, Bush's statement was ambivalent. He said, under, circum under certain circumstances, I would be for it. Under certain, I would not, without defining what circumstances. So the only member of the order who's had anything to do with SDI has been ambivalent. In other words, leaving the way open to say no. Well, maybe the certain circumstances have to do with who is calling the shots from the order. Which brings me to the question, is this a consensus that is reached, or is someone behind the scenes giving out these directions? I think the center, while Avril Harriman was alive, was in Brown Brothers Harriman, the investment bankers. Sixteen partners, eleven or twelve were members, were partners of these partners, were members of Skull and Bones. Uh, that was the center. The center appears to have shifted now more towards perhaps the Bush family, the Mellon families, that group of families uh, which go back into Texas oil, although people don't know this about Bush. Um, it appears to have shifted into that area. But I'm a little out of touch with my sources. Um, uh, they only show up uh, every so often they send me another batch of material. I've not had any contact for about 18 months now. These anonymous packages? Oh, yeah. They, they keep sending the anonymous packages. Um, I've not had anything for 18 months now. That's for real, anonymous packages. Yeah, they, they are just anonymous keep packages, yes. Yeah, yes. That is for real. Um, Somebody on the inside wants you to know. Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I better not give my suspicions. No. Okay. When I began to publish it, they ran some tests um, on me. Um, <laughs> I got a letter from a gentleman who claimed he was a member. He was writing under a code name, and he said he had more information to give me. He wanted to defect or something. I forget the exact word. <laughs> so I wrote back to not so my, any of my addresses, and said I wanted to meet him and uh, ask him certain questions. And he said that I would be hearing from two other members, and indeed I did hear from two other members, but they made a mistake. They gave me false names, but they didn't give me false addresses. <laughs> so I had one of my assistants go through the membership list and look for these three addresses. And she came up with a three like that. So I got their correct names. So I wrote back and I said, well, if you were on the level, you wouldn't be giving me a false name. And that just cut the communication like that. So it does exist. It is a secret society. They're not very happy with me. 
And that doesn't concern you too much? Oh, not in the slightest. I'm happy they're not happy with me. I, I, <laughs> I what I'd like to do is to get on with a subject that you've been most involved in since you've done all these things that we've been discussing, and that is psychotronics. I'd like to show you a video clip on Soviet psychotronics and ask for your comment, and we'll take off into that area. Okay. But in the Soviet Union, a radio frequency, or RF device, has been used for over 30 years to manipulate the moods of mental patients. It's called a LIDA machine. It radiates pulses of radio frequency energy, as well as light, sound, and heat. The pulse rate is in the extremely low frequency range, between 0 and 100 pulses per second. Dr. Ross 80 is the top researcher at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Loma Linda, California. He has been investigating the effects of the LIDA machine. Now, what do the Soviets use this machine for? Well, they don't use it anymore. We should be very clear that uh, this is a machine which is regarded by them as, as uh, somewhat obsolete technologically. This scientist, who did not want his identity revealed, is employed by the U.S. government and has done secret RF weapons research. He believes that tests done with the LIDA and similar machines prove that humans are susceptible to remote alterations of mood and awareness. Certain kinds of weak electromagnetic signals work exactly like drugs. And so the promise is that anything you can do with drugs, you could do with the right electromagnetic signals. Apparently, there are specific sites involved, specific functions involved. It's a matter of matching up, just like it is with a pill or a drug, to cause and effect. You could have a cause and effect relationship between a magnetic field and a biological function. This sound, which is received by shortwave radios in the United States, is generated by another Soviet radio frequency device. It is known as the woodpecker because of its tapping noise. It is broadcast by a number of high-powered radio transmitters operating deep in the Soviet Union since July 4, 1976. Though the official Defense Department explanation of the woodpecker is that it is an over-the-horizon radar designed to track U.S. missile launches, some uh, scientists suspect uh, that the woodpecker is designed to interfere with human uh, brain function. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the potential that this has for producing a direct psychoactive effect upon the total American population is there, has never been disproven. Dr. Robert Becker uh, is a pioneer in the field of bioeffects of electromagnetism. Uh, the signal range within which the woodpecker operates is that which has been reported by many investigators to produce a tranquilizing effect upon animals. We are just incredibly sensitive to these magnetic stimuli. Dr. Bob Beck, a PhD in nuclear engineering, has done extensive research into electromagnetic effects on humans. The signal was permeating power grids in the United States. It was being picked up by power lines, re-radiated. It was coming into the homes on the light circuits. Well, uh, I, it was a little unclear, but I knew two of the gentlemen on the uh, Bob Beck, and I think Becker was the other one. And basically, of course, they were talking about psychotronics. Um, if I can translate in my Please words, do. Uh, psychotronics um, is the, let me pick these words very carefully, is the long range, long range modification or manipulation of behavior by electronic, specifically radio means. In other words, you use uh, electromagnetic uh, energy, radio transmissions, to affect human behavior at a distance. In other words, what you're doing is that you are merging radio engineering and power psychology. This is what I think the Soviets can do. This is something which we have not in the West uh, looked at too carefully. What I think the Soviets can do, and this I think was the intent of this film clip, um, one, let me summarize what they can do and then in more de detail about one or two of these facets. One, they can manipulate behavior at a distance. For example, they could create a riot, which you couldn't stop in this auditorium right out of that transmitter. What they would do specifically is that, that uh, the name of the transmitter is not the one I know. I know it as the Gomel 
transmitter. Uh, he called it the woodpecker signal. Uh, but what they do, they broadcast the signal at, a, at uh, to create a riot, you, you broadcast 11 hertz, 11 cycles per second, beamed into this room. And it would, without you knowing, you would start to get uncomfortable, then upset, and uh, then I presume start getting a little, uh, little active, like throwing the plants around or breaking up chairs, <laughs> things like that. Um, you use specific, what are called the uh, radio frequency windows, uh, like 11 hertz will create that kind of behavior. Other, uh, other frequencies, <clears throat> other windows will create other kinds of behavior. You can create a passive behavior. You can make people go to sleep. You can create narcotic effects. It has been used actually as an antidote, uh, as a cure for narco narcotic addiction. Um, you can um, make people alert. You can make them misconstrue, misunderstand things. Each has a specific, very precise uh, frequency. Uh, we know what these frequencies are. We know the behavior modification that can be brought about. We know the Soviets are using it. Uh, let me give you two, three. I'll give you three examples. One, the Moscow Embassy, 1977, the State Department discovered that uh, its employees were being zapped by, by what they called microwaves that were really these uh, transmissions, extremely low frequency transmissions. The ambassador, in fact, had uh, heart problems as a result of it. And you can induce medical effect. You can induce heart attacks at a distance with certain frequencies. Um, that's one example we know. The State Department then took the wrong approach it's put screens on windows, but we know that copper and steel screening will not shield from alpha, extremely low frequency waves. It, the, there is another antidote, which we can get into later if you want. Um, one, we know you can modify behavior through beaming radio waves on specific frequencies at a distance. We can how, do that. How great a distance? Well, they're, 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 the, the um, transmitter they're using is at Gomel, we know that that was beamed on Eugene, Oregon in the late 70s. Uh, they were picking up, I forget the, uh, the cycles per second, I think it was about nine, nine hertz. And uh, that was very intense at 3,000 feet. They got public health people picked up a number of, well, I think 20, 30, 40 cases of um, disorientation, headaches, uh, nausea, that kind of thing, which you would get from that frequency. A more clear example is not Eugene, Oregon, although I'm fairly sure of that case, is the Canadian cases, Kirkland Lake and Timmins, Ontario, both bombarded by the Soviets. In this case, I'm in touch with a Canadian scientist who did the analysis for the Canadian government. There is no question in his mind that the Soviets bombarded Kirkland Lake and Timmins with uh, a frequency which would create disorientation, headaches, and nausea, that kind of thing. So the distance, uh, if you can... Um, it's as, if you can get a radio wave in there, you can get this effect in there. It's so the frequency on which it operates. The purpose of this was an experiment to prove what they could do and what they could do in wartime? I think in the early 70s, <clears throat> this was experimentation. Uh, I think what they're doing today is not exper experimentation. If you look at the State Department, which as I see it, has not made one decision in our favor. Every decision is against us. If you look what happened in the Moscow Embassy, if you get Schultz saying that uh, counterintelligence is, is not productive, you know, these ridiculous statements, you begin to think that, okay, you can bring this about through psychoactive warfare, psychoactive manipulation use, using elf waves, uh, extremely low frequency waves. And that's what Bob, uh, Robert Beck and uh, the other gentleman now, were do saying. The, do the that. Soviets select certain individuals in the United States, or do they take a picture of them and put it in a machine ah, in the Soviet that's a Union? Different field. Or what do they do? Uh, there's several different things here. Firstly, um, I, don't, I cannot prove that the Soviets have done this, but what I do know is that the West Germans issued their diplomats with protective devices about 10 years ago. In fact, I have the circuit diagrams for these protective devices. The West Germans have recognized the problem. They have taken moves against it. 
The State Department in 78 was not recognizing the problem. I don't know if they've taken any moves against it. It looks as if they have not. By their behavior. By their behavior. It's no coincidence that everybody in the State Department is uh, uh, soft on communism wherever. Yes, you could bring this about by um, psychoactive manipulation. Well, case in point today is Korea. You think the Soviets are doing that? Riot, night after night, day after day, doesn't this, stop? Uh, the frequency they know, 11 hertz. You want to create a riot in here, I, I'll prove it to you. If I can get the equipment. <laughs> Why don't you just try first putting everybody to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can put people to sleep too. Yeah. Um, now this, um, this is where I am very, very disturbed because in the West, we don't think in terms of warfare, certainly not to achieve objectives. Well, at least most of us don't, except the elite. And I'm concerned that <coughs> while the elite is out to control the world, the Russian, given the Russian mind and the technology we've given them, is going to use this technology back against us in forms which we don't accept. And there's no question that our establishment engineers don't, haven't until recently accepted uh, um, behavioral modification to radio engineering. Now, both these gentlemen you noticed on here, they can talk because they're outside the establishment. They do not work for the government. In fact, I just had a letter from one of them. And uh, this is the consensus among these people that these, one, this can be done, and secondly, it is being done. Now, there are other things that, in addition to uh, behavioral manipulation, they're a little, little more, a little harder to pinpoint. I rather suspect that the service <clears throat> can identify objects at a distance, say through radar. They can estimate the shape, the size, and the composition. In other words, one can analyze the return spectrum and analyze that and find the composition of what they're looking at. So theoretically, you could put a beam into, say, this top secret installation uh, inside it and you could get a picture back very roughly giving the shape, the size and the composition of the article that was the other end of that beam. They can use it, I suspect, for telepathy. Telepathy for a long time has been a random sort of phenomenon. I think possibly you could use radio, beam, radio waves as a carrier for telepathy, perhaps even for psychokinesis too. Well, telepathy can be mind manipulation yeah. if someone doesn't recognize it as an yeah. exterior communication. Yes. So that basically is what psycho psychokinesis is. Then the one you mentioned about the, uh, the putting the picture in the well. Um, the number of end uses for that, I don't know which one you had in mind, but for example, it could be used for finding people. I, uh, tracing people. You could put a picture of a person within this machine and uh, through a map have it trace out the coordinates where the person is. I, I heard that it was used in one case, uh, the US Navy, and now I cannot verify this, it's only what I, it's just hearsay, that the US Navy did experiment with this kind of operation by getting the signatures of Soviet submarine commanders and using this process for identifying the location of this particular submarine. Now that's a fantastic achievement by if a signature. Yes. You can't hide anything on this earth, not even a thimble. Yes. Now do you think the Soviets are targeting certain segments of our population that are the leadership, the Congress, the military, or do you think that over the pole are coming uh, ELF waves that are affecting the entire population, beaming these between 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning and so forth? Yes. Well, if you look at Washington, you know, you go into Washington, it's like a world apart. And you go through all, like we did earlier, do we explain these things by stupidity, by ignorance? And you're almost left up by default with this behavioristic manipulation. It's the only one that really fits. I mean, these people are so out of touch with reality, as I see it, and as you see it, that um, this really becomes the only explanation of the whole water. Well, when you have a few people that are not in any way influenced by it and take their stand 
for reality, for truth, for common sense. Do these people have a natural uh, repellent of, of these kind of energy waves? Is it the strength of God within them? Or what is it that uh, keeps some people totally clear in their thinking? Well, as I've tried to say today, I've always explained it my position on the basis I'm just thick-headed and rather slow. I don't see things the same way as other people. But I think there's got to be an inner force and uh, a spiritual power which enables us, perhaps gives us an inner strength to see truth, to see things as they really are. And uh, these people, as you mentioned, don't have this inner strength, this inner power, this inner reflection of God. The people that succumb. The people that are doing these things. The people projecting the waves and those that are receptive to them. Yes, both, both sides. Both, both sides. Hands. And when you look at the people who are receptive and who tout this line, uh, they seem to have had the capacity for vulnerability to this before they came under that attack. Like think, Schultz, for instance. Yes, the vulnerability. Yeah, the, like Schultz. I mean, yeah. you could say he's a victim of ELF waves, but Schultz was Schultz before he was a victim of ELF waves, is what I'm saying. Yes, it's whether the Soviets manipulated his psychological weaknesses or yes. the ELF waves brought them about. But the, the kind of person you get in Washington, a person who searches for power, you can guarantee that 95% of the people in Washington have got this lack of inner strength, as you mentioned. Earlier. You know, if it's been observed by top people in Washington that the attrition rate on the part of people visiting the Soviet Union and then coming back and being soft on communism is amazing. In fact, they can go to the Soviet Union and be totally turned around in their views and become pro-Soviet. Do you think that, therefore, there is a greater effect of this mind manipulation in Soviet territory at closer range? You're getting this with the businessmen. These top businessmen go to the Soviet Union and they come back. Dwayne Andrews is a very good example. Uh, he's chairman of uh, Archer, Daniel, Archer Daniels Midland. You, they come back from the Soviet Union and they may as well be reading a translation of Pravda when they come back. It's the straight party line, right the way down. No, they weren't always like that. But they do go visit Moscow and they come back and they, they gradually get into this party line business. What is very disturbing with a man like Dwayne Andrews is uh, he is a very big financial contributor to people like Sangadol. He backed uh, Hubert Humphrey for many years. Um, but you do get this phenomenon, not so much with diplomats, but you certainly get it with businessmen. They go there, they wind and dine, I suspect they get this psychological manipulation and they come back and then they, uh, they parrot the party line. When you challenge them, they become confused and hostile. That's a real telltale sign, isn't real it? Real telltale sign. The hostility because is a front because there's no reason behind it. It's a, it's, a, it's a bluster. It's a bluster. And I've seen that at first hand. They become very antagonistic. I've seen it too. Yes. Which is weakness. There's nothing behind it. They, they're confused themselves why they're saying this and why they're doing this. And then they fear the reality they're being told because yeah. somehow their inner mechanism is repolarized yeah. around something else. Yes. To what extent is this humanity manipulable from any source? We just discovered psychotronics may have been around a long time. Begun to have really a number of massive effects on the population, not only psychotronics, but as you mentioned, drug use, uh, changing music. Uh, these things coincide in the last 15 years. That's right. They've almost made a suicidal world. That's right. And you know, as you come into an area like this, you realize this is one of the few oases of sanity left in the world. <laughs> uh, let, let, me, let, me give you, let me give you an example. Uh, those of you who know San Francisco, I was, I was looking for a shortcut in the, the 280 freeway in San Francisco the other day, and I cut through some side streets. Uh, Boom, right through my rear windshield, somebody threw the steel base of a bumper jack 
that thing weighs, what, 10 pounds, shattered my rear windshield. Fortunately, as I heard it, I accelerated, so it landed on the seat, it didn't hit me. That is the extent of violence in the cities. This is peaceful San Francisco. My car now, today, is in the shop. When I get back, it'll have a new rear windshield in. And the cities are disintegrating. There's no question about that. I mean, this is, uh, I call this an oasis of sanity, and it, because this disintegration is going to continue. It's not all Soviet, it's not all elf waves. It's not all drugs, it's not any one thing. It's a combination of things in which all societies are disintegrating. And this is going to accelerate in the coming decade. It's an era of history. Yes. And it's happened before. Yes. You can look at it in prophecy, astrology, all different areas and ways. I think this particular area that you're into is very fascinating because it, it could make one feel helpless if one, again, didn't have the power of God to lean back upon. This idea that something can influence your mind uh, with such intensity, especially if you would consider yourself a target uh, because you have uh, creative, original thinkers, as you say. This is an, an, o an oasis of individuals mm -hmm. and individualism. Well, you've explained why you left Malibu and came up here. <laughs> um, it really didn't hit me till uh, I got here yesterday, yesterday evening, and I first saw daylight here at 6 o'clock this morning. You know, the, the San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, these major cities, Washington, I've been in each of these cities over the last few months, uh, suicidal, self-destructive. And you come here, and I haven't met anybody yet whom I would say was self-destructive or, or suicidal. <laughs> uh, what, what impresses me is uh, the willingness to do what has to be done with, uh, with pride, with love, productive things, which is the complete opposite to what is going on in society as a whole. Well, this is a, what, in, to put it in biblical terms, this is a peculiar people that you find here. <laughs> and that peculiar people has seen and read the handwriting on the wall in those cities. And they've said, we want to come apart with our families yes. and be independent of this downward spiral, this, that is unexplainable, really, in its point of origin. Uh, the tragedy is that so many people in the cities are caught up in this. There's no escape. There's no escape. Whole subcultures are now. There's just no way out. In the affluent suburbs, yes, there's still a way out if they want to take it. But uh, uh, when you look at many areas of our big cities, uh, they're doomed. They're doomed. They're doomed. And the people know they're doomed. The heaviest incidence of drug use is in your low income levels, errors. That shocked me when I found that out. That people just trying to forget, I suppose. And uh, you can look at it from this arena here in a clearer perspective than you can uh, when you're sitting down, say, in San Francisco or Los Angeles. We're undergoing a, a tragedy within society. And it, it may not fully evolve maybe for 10 or 20 years. It's almost as though they sense the end, whether it has to do with the Soviets or things we know not. And they're behaving like lemmings. They're, yes. they're going to rush to their destruction almost by a force, which does make us turn again to psychotronics. I yes. mean, it is, it is, one can call it karma, one can call it the age, but there seems to be another ingredient that is impelling it whereby they are no longer in control of their own minds. It's almost as if there is a force or a power outside the Soviets and outside our elite. Well, the only ones we know about outside of all of this are the UFOs, and they have a superior technology. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that they have genetically engineered uh, the human race uh, to limit that race, to not be able to rise to their levels. We are showing breakthroughs today in space, which is probably alarming to them. 
because this is a very important planet for resources, for water, for refueling. They've been around for centuries. Drawings of, of UFOs, as, as you know, appear in ancient uh, writings on the walls of primitives and so forth. So there are beings that could accomplish this well, how conceivably. Is it, how is it that so many of us can escape? I think, escape it's, influence? I think it's the power of God. I think that light itself, the light of God, actually penetrates the body's cells. Mm -hmm. And that, that God gave His creation a divine spark, which is a sacred fire that we each have in our hearts, and that the power of this sacred fire is greater than all other material power. But it's still not strong enough for us to live within society, outside society. No, it's strong enough to take us out of that society while the rest of the people are trapped. And so we come apart and be a separate people, as the ancient prophets told us we had to do. And I think that that is the untouchable element in the creation who descended from God. And I think that there's another creation, a mechanization man that was created by fallen angels who had this genetic engineering capacity. And that they could create a robot creation, a test tube uh, creature, but they could never endow it with a divine spark. And this creature they could totally manipulate. So it was in their best interest to multiply this pattern to create masses who would carry out their designs, could be programmable by such uh, waves and frequencies, and could defeat then the few who were actually the seed of Christ on the planet by their sheer numbers. And so God gave us a key that the seed of light should unite together so that they would not have to stand alone against this foreboding crowd of of the antithesis of reality. Well, could I ask you a question? Why did you come to this particular spot? <laughs> uh, you know, ever since I got here yesterday, let me be frank with you, um, <laughs> which I usually am. <laughs> I was driving down from Livingston, and I got, as I came down this valley, I got this feeling of a strong power uh, within the valley. Well, man, I'm obviously telling you something you already know, so I don't bother to tell you. So I guess you have a reason for being here. <laughs> I think that the power you feel shows the power of the sons and daughters of God when they use the science of the spoken word to endow a physical location with the power of God because they have a threefold flame. Now, that is apart from why we chose to be here. But I think the power you feel is the fact that thousands of people have come here at these conferences and hundreds of people live here and on a daily basis invoke the power of God for the protection of themselves and for all light bearers in the world, for the protection of freedom and those things we hold dear, to try to stem the tide of this downward course of civilization by a light that can be invoked from the spiritual planes, which does not descend to this octave until, unless we call it forth. And there is a power in this valley that comes from the people who live here, but that antedates their coming and which also drew them here. Is it not related to geographical location? I think it is located to geographical location in terms of the crisscrossing of energy fields on the planet. But what we understand is that the Royal Teton Range, the, the Grand Teton uh, Mountain, is an ancient focus of a spiritual hierarchy of ascended masters and archangels, and that it is consecrated with a great spiritual power. Our coming to this place goes back 2,000 years ago for me to the time of Jesus when I remember having been his disciple Martha and when he prophesied to me that we would reincarnate and be here again 2,000 years later and that he would direct us to a place prepared in the new world where we would gather and the light bearers of the world would gather in this place. And so I remember, as Jesus recalled this scene for me, 
that I was quite astonished as to how he would accomplish such a feat. He would be ascended, we would still be in embodiment. It would be a strange land. We would come here and we would know the place in a vast wilderness. So he promised me that he would place a mark upon that place that would be unmistakable and it would be that sign and it would quicken the inner soul memory. And that sign was a giant uh, jet of water coming out of the earth. And this water would have the appearance almost of fire when it would come out of the earth. This was even more astounding to me. What was astonishing about this experience is that we found and located this place by divine direction it meeting all the spiritual and physical requirements, an inner retreat as well as a place to be self-sufficient agriculturally and economically by having, being able to, to raise livestock and, and grow our own crops and so forth. So after we had purchased the property, it was then that Jesus quickened in me the memory of this prior experience. And then I realized the sign was Old Faithful and it was unmistakable. And uh, all my life I had, been, I had been drawn to Old Faithful, but I had never been to see it before we purchased this property. So we feel that there is, if you, would, if you would have it, an electromagnetic field connected with this property and the adjacent wilderness, lands, park territory, forest territory, going all the way to the Grand Teton, which is about 79 miles as the eagle flies from here. So this particular valley is very precious because we feel in this particular place where the tent is and in, in this entire valley which we call the heart, we feel the pulsations of Gautama Buddha as having established his western Shambhala corresponding to that ancient focus of Sanak Kumara in the Gobi Desert. And there is a correlation of the lines of force in the earth between these spiritual retreats of the brotherhood and we feel that this this land was prepared and preserved for us by Jesus and by Saint Germain so that's why we're here Thank you. <laughs> well I must make one comment you certainly picked an isolated spot I mean, Montana itself is isolated, but you have to pick an isolated spot within Montana. Well, it's, it's a very secure sense that you feel here. Oh, yes. Whenever I flew up from Los Angeles to Bozeman Airport and I would put my feet on the ground, the earth would feel solid. And I would only know by contrast that Los Angeles earth really never felt solid. Mm -hmm. But. The amazing thing about it is this is not really the kind of place that all of these people would follow someone to unless they in their own hearts had the same inner magnetism drawing them to those same energies and I think that the power you feel for one thing shows the sensitivity that you can only have by the flame of the heart. Only the inner fire can give you a reading on the, the spiritual power that is here. If it, if it were otherwise, people would have long ago claimed this place as something extraordinary, but they were not sensitive to it, and it remained sealed until we should have come. And, and we feel it's a very important spot to preserve, as you call it, sanity, the clarity of mind necessary to defeat the forces, whatever they are, whoever they are, that seem to be defeating civilization entirely. What happens if large numbers of people decide they want sanity and flock out of the cities into Corwin Springs? Well, they have the whole Yellowstone Park, Forest <laughs> Service, and Wilderness to, to, to flock to. Um, you know, this is private property. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to decide to do that because um, it's hard to make it here economically. Yes. Uh, the summers are short, the winters are long. There's a lot more ideal places to be. Anyway, we've been here since 81. We haven't seen any mass exodus uh, from the no, cities up here. No, but I sense here. the deterioration, as you mentioned, in the cities. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are beginning to be very concerned. Where do we go? If they all suddenly wake up one morning and decide that they're going to come to Corwin Springs. <laughs> Mm 
I guess we have to cross that bridge when we come to it, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I must say, I've very much enjoyed my visit here. Well, we're not yeah. done because you hear that rain? Excuse me? We're not done yet because oh, you hear uh, the rain? The rain reminds us that you haven't said a word about weather manipulation by the Soviets. Oh, yes. <laughs> Well, and especially uh, in connection with the Challenger and uh, other defeats in our space program. Well, let me summarize the three ways basically to manipulate the weather. The traditional way used, I think the Air Force spends about 200 million years, uh, 200 million dollars a year on this first method, which is dumping silver iodide crystals into clouds and that creates rainfall. It's very primitive, it's not accurate. It creates chemical pollution, and it's on the way out. Uh, the second method is used by the Soviets. Well, the Soviets used the first method still. They are developing a second method based on Nikola Te Tesla's work, uh, the magnifying transmitter. They can um, induce standing waves, use these standing waves to divert the jet stream by diverting the jet stream at the upper levels, you change global weather. This probably has happened in the last few years. Um, it's become much wetter in some areas, much colder in the United States. It's become actually much warmer in some parts of the Soviet Union. These are gigantic, uh, almost global effects brought about by changing the jet stream. I mentioned it in connection with Challenger in which by changing jet stream they brought colder weather down over Florida. That's the second way. The third way is very new. I only came across it. They came to me about uh, four or five months ago. A man called Trevor Constable, who is an um, electronics engineer on the Matson Line container, ch container ships. They have been doing a whole series of experiments with what they call primary energy, which the ether, which is the ether, the belt of primary energy around the Earth. They have constructed weather guns. Uh, weather guns operate basically as a function of the speed of the vessel against the, the movement of this belt of energy and the shape and construction of the gun. They can now bring down rainfall just about wherever they want it. I hope he's not responsible for this today. <laughs> um, I, I think I sent you a tape of some of the experiments. They've got a lot further than that. So they're basically these three different methods. The Soviets are aware of the constable method. They called it the um, plasmoid, plasmoid energy. But so far as I know, they're not using it. So basically, you have three methods. Now. Last year, we had a terrific drought in the southeastern United States. Would you attribute that to weather manipulation? Yes. Yeah, because we know the Soviets have changed the jet stream. The changes in the jet stream would have brought about uh, the increased cold weather in some areas, increased rainfall in other areas, that kind of, uh, that kind of end result, yes. So it becomes a, a warfare again. I think the Soviets today are using psychotronics and warfare using Tesla techniques against us. What about producing uh, lightning a la Tesla? Oh, well, Tesla can do it. That was proved as in his experiments in Colorado in the turn of the century. But do the Constant. Soviets do it? Excuse me? Do the Soviets do it? Oh, yes. They Have they used ball. it against our rockets? I seem to recall a report in which they used ball lightning against ball lightning, ball lightning mm -hmm. against ours. Constable can definitely produce it. Um, I have some tremendous photographs using his method of producing fork lightning over uh, Los Angeles Bay. In fact, I'll have another video available maybe in about 30 days showing this. So yes, you can create lightning. In terms of this primary energy, you describe it as being clean and cheap, freely accessible by anyone with technical expertise. Uh, it sounds uh, almost too good to be true. Uh, 
What's, what's that well, going to do with the, to the energy companies, this primary energy you're interested in? Well, first of all, there is a prerequisite. Uh, the operator has to know what it's doing. What it will do if it becomes generally accepted, if it can be done, your whole existing infrastructure, uh, your transportation systems, uh, the steel industry, everything we know is going to suddenly become outdated. Because here you've got a clean, cost free source of energy. The weather guns they use to bring about rainfall, the, cap the uh, raw material cost is about $20. In fact, you have enough PVC pipes sitting over there to make 100 weather guns. I saw it this morning. You have to know how to make them, and the operators ha know, have to know how to use them. So what you've got is a very low capital cost item where you need operator skill and uh, this will bring about, in the 21st century, I think, a revolution in the way we use energy. The key is the conversion of this primary belt, this energy belt, into driving a rotary shaft, spinning a shaft. Once we can make an engine out of it, once we can make, use this energy to make an engine, then you can, that's the end of uh, the internal combustion engine, atomic energy, uh, diesel engines that whole era which began a hundred years ago. Well, who's into this and how near are they in using this primary The energy? key man is Trevor Constable. He's electronics engineer for the Matson line. Electronics man. Some of his key assistants have worked for companies like Boeing. So these are not run-of-the-mill ordinary engineers. Uh, engineers. These are top-level engineers. They how far along they, they can control rainfall, and I wish they were here now. Uh, they can extinguish forest fires, they can remove sm fog and smog at very low cost. They say that a Dutch group has been able to solve the rotary motion problem uh, and develop an engine, but I've not yet seen that engine in operation. I'd say it's about five or ten years away. Five or ten years away? You think it's not going to get suppressed? It's going to get into the hands of the people? Well, the constable is aware of the establishment, is aware of the Soviets. Uh, he has been uh, training people to operate these weather guns, but of course, they could be suppressed. This itself could. Uh totally change the configuration of space, of strategic uh, defense, of the Soviet and the U.S. Uh, confrontation? I think it already has done. Uh, we talked about psychotronic warfare, we talked about weather warfare. With these two things alone, the Soviets could defeat the United States without us even knowing there was a war going on. Well, I, th I think it's already happening. Yes. I think the Soviets are successfully a beaming waves yes. that are making people jump out of buildings yes. and doing all kinds of things. And I think they have this, I don't know what to call it, except a satanic mind, but they, they like to let you know they're in control in subtle ways. And they like to just observe the torture mm -hmm. of putting a population in a torture chamber and watching it disintegrate and not even knowing that it's being victimized. Yes, yes. I don't think there's any defense against psychotronics except to raise one's vibration. And that's why I made the album The Only Way to Go is Up. You have to go up in vibration to escape psychotronics because they can only hit mm -hmm. at a certain level. Well, theoretically, um, if you uh, transmit on another frequency to counterbalance the destructive frequency, it's like anti-noise will eliminate noise. I have the circuit, circuit diagrams for an instrument which the West Germans are using. You said you were going to bring us a set that they got left home, right? Uh, the circuit diagram, yes, I forgot to bring it. But uh, I, I will uh, make it available to you. Um, apparently, it protects you for about three feet, radius of three feet. And what does this uh, protection accomplish? Well, it neutralizes the destructive frequency. And so if they're beaming 11 hertz at you, 
it will neutralize, you adjust your instrument to neutralize 11 hertz, which would create the riot, 11 hertz would create the riot here. And if you know how and if you have the diagrams, you can build this. Oh yes, I've got the circuit diagrams. You cannot import them into the United States, the Food and Drug Administration. <laughs> Food and Drug? It is wisdom. <laughs> it thinks you shouldn't have them. But you can call it anything you want to. You can call it a toy and still manufacture it. Can you create disease and abnormalities in cells and cell function? Yes. By, by these you, waves? You can create disease with waves. You know, the Soviets are very vociferous about accusing us of having created AIDS. Does that tell you anything about the Soviets? Yes, yeah, a guilty, a guilty conscience. Well, a guilty something. Yeah, I'm quite convinced they're using both psychotronic warfare and weather warfare. Yeah. Now, to neutralize the energy and also to capture this, uh, this universal energy that is all around is going to make a big difference yes. in life. I'd like you to sum up and tell the camera what you'd like to tell the American people as a result of your research. What are the most important steps to take? What action can we take now that we have this awareness? You mean assuming that people are aware of what's going on? Well, let's take this group. These, well, people, this group. these people are from all over the world and the United States. And they're very aware and they're action oriented. They want to take action based on their awareness. Oh, well, yes, I think my words would be quite clear to take back specific messages from here and talk, talk, talk and convert and make people aware of what you know and what you believe in. Once people become aware from your standpoint and your, what you know, what is the action to take to turn things around? First of all, you have to get numbers, large numbers of people aware. Um, and then, I don't know, it depends if we're in the middle of chaos, then all we can do is just retreat into the forest. But if we're still as we are today with a certain amount of political activity, I suppose one could go the congressional route, although that seems pretty hopeless. Political activity uh, seems to be less and less likely as a solution as we go along. It may be that we may have to just live through the cata cataclysm, the chaos, and emerge at the other side. Be survivors. Be survivors. Learn to be a survivor. I think it may well come down to that. Too many people, particularly in the big cities, as long as they get the, the, the payroll check or the welfare check, as long as that arrives on a specific day each month, they're not thinking beyond that particular day. That's the danger. Uh, people are w unwilling to look at bad news and act on the basis of bad news. So you may go back and you may be wasting your time in talking to people. But you may find more converts, more recruits. Um, but that, um, that I can't answer how many. Well, I think you're right about surviving. Because inside of yourself, you sense the hope that if things are this bleak, there has to be a brighter tomorrow. And we, if we can survive to that tomorrow, we can build a new world. We can even build a golden age. If I can be honest, I, uh, I don't think we've begun to see the bad side, the, the chaos that is ahead. I don't think we've begun to see it. Everything you're talking about, if you simply track it into mm -hmm. the future, its end is chaos. Yes. Yes. Cataclysm, yes. disintegration of matter, yes. minds. Yes. And we may, the whole thing may have to disintegrate before we can rebuild it. I think that if the difference between this group and those in the cities is that we have perceived clearly that yes. Yes. there is a divine will that wants us to survive. Yes. And we are determined to do so because someone must bear the torch of civilization exactly 
and a spiritual teaching into the future. Apparently everybody has made a personal commitment to survive and to carry the torch forward. They wouldn't be here if they hadn't. Tony Sutton, you've done it again. <laughs> you've been the flame of freedom that speaks at Summit University Forum, and we thank you. Thank you very much.